Robin Hood Radio presents Agriculture from Turkana Farms. Here's Peter Davies. Foraging, that is, wandering the countryside in search of food and medicinal herbs, is virtually disappearing as an activity in modern life. One reason is that there is less and less accessible open land that one is free to forage in, field or meadow, woodland or wetland. Undoubtedly, Another major reason for the decline in foraging is our modern food distribution and preservation systems. The ubiquitous supermarket offering as it does a seeming plethora of foods available at any season seems to have made foraging redundant. In the days before modern food distribution, foraging for those coming out of a long winter without greens and most fresh vegetables was undoubtedly an important food source. I actually experienced my first real foraging experience without realizing what it was when at the age of eight in the spring of 1947, I was taken by Fred Lehman, my stepfather's mother's second husband with whom we first lived when we arrived in this country on a five-mile ramble from Fred's in West Hinsdale, Illinois, through pastures, fields, wetlands, and woods, foraging for wild asparagus. In those days in Hinsdale, before subdivisions appeared, it was a short walk to the countryside, and our ramble involved no roads or paths, just open country. Fred, who was in his 70s, had been foraging all his life, and therefore knew what asparagus looked like and where wild asparagus were likely to appear. There, he therefore had no difficulty filling his basket. I, who had never seen asparagus in the wild or even eaten asparagus, turned out to be a dud of a forager, something Fred was not shy about commenting on. After reaching his ultimate destination, the tavern at Salt Creek, where he refreshed himself, but not me, we turned back for the five-mile walk over hill and dale to Fred's house on Bruner Street. Despite the mixed nature of this first foraging experience and the 10-mile walk, it was an experience I thoroughly enjoyed, later enhanced by eating this delicious vegetable for the first time. Since then, I've realized in retrospect that even before I was eight, While living in Wales, I had already experienced a kind of foraging. With the able-bodied men fighting at the front and the women drafted in to take their places in the war effort, we children in those war years were largely unsupervised. The gang on my street in Cardiff, whenever we were not in school, took off on rambles led by the older boys, rambles that often went on for a whole day, sometimes into the early evening. One of our favorite rambles was in the Leckwith Hills, visible from our street, but actually miles away. We sometimes went armed with large sticks, which in our vivid imaginations were for hunting wild boars. Our lunch consisted of what we could forage, particularly blackberries and any fruit we could snitch as we passed orchards. As we trooped through the countryside, climbing the heights of the Leckwith Hills, we popped into bags whatever we found in the way of mushrooms and toadstools, which, once we had arrived home, to our disappointment, the adults wisely discarded. This was an important early lesson, that foraging required an understanding of what plants are edible and what are not. The first time I encountered foraging as a serious way of supplementing a diet was when I lived in Turkey in the early 60s. The degree to which foraging was part of the local food economy became apparent to me the first month I lived in Izmir. Because shopping for groceries took so inordinately long, you bargained for every radish, every tomato, every lettuce, our overworked faculty at the American College collectively hired a buyer, Basri Effendi, who did most of our food purchasing for us. When I gave him my first grocery list, which had a considerable list of herbs, Bostri burst out laughing, pointing out that he only had to cross the road next to the campus, where in those days the countryside began, where he could pick rosemary, thyme, mint, basil, oregano, sage, and bay leaves with no difficulty. So in Turkey, even in a city of 250,000 in the early 1960s, it was still second nature 
to forage. But it is particularly in the coastal regions outside the cities along the Aegean and Mediterranean that foraging is important to this day, as I've learned on my annual visits back to Turkey. The Anatolian peasantry in these regions traditionally supplements their diet with a wide variety of wild foods in addition to foraging for dye materials and their medicinal needs. They forage in the hills and on uninhabited islets just off the coast for wild sage used chiefly to make their organic tea called adachai, that is island tea. They forage for a wild basil, known in this country as Greek basil, as well as thyme and oregano, correction, rather than, correction, rather than cultivating it. In midsummer, they gather baskets of wild marguerites, which they saute as a vegetable, and baskets of purslane, which they mix with yogurt, olive oil, and crushed garlic, and serve as a salad. On the seashore, they forage for seaweed, which they marinate, and serve as something between a vegetable and a salad. Perhaps Mark and I have been closest to Turkish foraging in Kale, a village of a few hundred people, virtually cut off from the mainland with no streets, only steep, rough step walks. There we have made a close acquaintance with the Iranja family through their daughter, Nuket. Her mother is an assiduous forager who does it not only for her family, but also to sell what she finds to supplement the family income, precariously dependent on subsistence-level fishing and the sale of their embroidered scarves to the yacht people. In addition to the foraging already described, Mrs. Iranja seems to have created a small home industry by foraging the large dark brown seeds of the wild carobs, which she cooks down to a kind of molasses called pekmez. She seems to successfully market bottles of this pekmez and always makes sure that we leave with a large bottle of carob pekmez as well as bags of wild sage and, of course, a selection of Nuket's beautiful scarves. The closest we have come to seeing foraging on this scale in this country is to be found in the tiny hamlet of Mill River, just outside of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. There, my friend of nearly 50 years, Anita Fleury, lives and forages. It is there we have been regaled with her meals, including such delicacies as nettle soup and sautéed weeds such as amaranth and purslane. Anita modestly pretends not to know that much about foraging, but actually has absorbed a wealth of information on the culinary and medicinal values of local plant life, and has a real flair for incorporating her friends into her delicious meals. I am hoping to interview her in the near future for another bulletin on foraging. Meanwhile, Mark and I, at Turkana Farms, with our rather limited knowledge of foraging, uh, we only know purslane, lamb's quarter, and amaranth, nothing approaching the considerable use that Anita regularly makes of local wild plants. Peter Davies and his partner Mark Scherzer are proprietors of Turkana Farms, specializing in heritage breeds of livestock on their 40-acre farm in Germantown, New York. Peter also presides over Turkana Odyssey, in which he customizes cultural tours in Turkey for small groups, which he calls an insider's view of Turkey. And his third hat is Turkana Gallery of Old and Antique Kilims, which he operates in the Wall Street area of Manhattan. Mark presides over his law firm, Mark Scherzer Law Office, which specializes in health law, also in the Wall Street area. Their farm website? TurkanaFarms.com. Their email, farm at TurkanaFarms.com or 518-537-3815.